I like to say the arts matter because we matter, because the arts are us. And I think we can all agree we're at a critical moment in human history and we're at a critical moment in the United States of America, where to see our own and see each other's humanity is crucial. Welcome to the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange, a podcast from IPM Advancement. Our mission is to help you raise more money so you can make the world a better place. Today's topic, next-gen donors and the arts. Last year saw a measurable drop in philanthropic donations to nonprofit arts and culture organizations. While some are quick to blame the pandemic, others believe the bigger concern is the growing disconnect between the rising generation of donors and the arts and culture sector. In today's podcast episode, IPM senior consultant Rich Frazier is joined by Melissa Cowley-Wolf, our in-house expert on this topic, and Jamie Mayer, chair of the Nathan Cummings Foundation and a next-generation donor herself. Together, they will unpack these latest findings and share practical tips for how arts organizations can bridge the perceived gap by next-gen donors between the arts and the social impact causes they care most about. Take it away, Rich. Welcome to this episode of the Nonprofit Fundraising Exchange podcast. I'm Rich Frazier. I'm the senior consultant for IPM Advancement. And joining me today, well, I'll let them introduce themselves. Jamie, why don't you start? Hi, I'm Jamie Mayer. I chair the Nathan Cummings Foundation, and I'm a theater and film producer. Welcome, Jamie. And Melissa. I am Melissa Cowley Wolf, and I'm a consultant with IPM and the founder of MCW Projects and the Arts Funders Forum. All right. So today's topic, we're talking about next generation philanthropy and the arts, and it's, it's relevant because, you know, the Giving USA 2021 report just dropped in June, and, you know, the good news, giving was up 5%, a little bit over 5% uh, from 2019, and that's clearly good news, but the arts and culture sector kind of took a hit, right? So they experienced a drop in giving of 7.5%. And that's significant because the arts and culture had seen increases in giving year over year since 2012. They held steady in 2018, but they didn't take a drop. So, Melissa, what's the context here? What's our takeaway? Is this troubling or is this a blip due to COVID? Well, it's, I think it's a little troubling anytime in a sector experiences a decrease in giving. And I think taken within the context of COVID, it's worrisome, but also over the years. So let's start out by explaining that um, and reminding our audience that we're currently ex- uh, experiencing the largest intergenerational transfer of wealth in the history of the country, if not the world. While we've seen giving to the arts decrease a bit over the years, it's held pretty steady at only 4% of overall charitable giving. And what's interesting about that is it also represents 4% of GDP, employs millions of workers, and is actually a bigger industry than tourism and agriculture. So when you look at those trend lines, while there was some encouragement over the years, year by year, when you put it together, it's been troubling. And then we hit this moment of COVID where every sector was worried about their charitable giving. But we did see from the Giving USA report that seven of the nine charitable sectors saw an increase with the exception of health. And that might sound counterintuitive, but that's because a lot of these disease advocacy organizations, their fundraising is based on the gathering model. So the runs, the walks, these opportunities to gather and raise money. And then arts and cultures dip is pretty staggering, especially when you think about that we saw stories over, especially during that period of high quarantine last March, we saw folks out on their balconies in Italy playing music for each other. We saw people of all backgrounds, generations turning to music, visual art making in their home when they were under quarantine, watching uh, cultural and artistic productions online. But somehow something was missed. The connection was not made that while we turn to the arts and art, different art forms to stay safe and sane in moments of incredible um, turbulence, we didn't see that play out in terms of funding. 
these sectors that produce this work. So there's definitely a disconnect there. And what this tells me and my colleagues in the art sector is that we have still have much work to do in order to show the connection between the arts and impact and how the arts make our lives better and how they need to be funded adequately in order to do so. You mentioned the intergenerational transfer of wealth that's happening. That's important to note because when nonprofits make their case for support, it has to connect with the people who actually have the money to give, right? So what are you seeing in terms of how this newest generation approaches philanthropy versus the kind of philanthropy practiced by older generations? The biggest thing that we're seeing is a difference in giving between generations. You see a traditional philanthropic class that's very transactional driven. They really came of philanthropic age in the uh, post-war era where these cultural organizations that were built across the country represented sources of national pride and civic pride, and also came of age during what is called the Bilbao effect. Um, Frank Gehry's building for the Guggenheim in Bilbao, Spain, really completed that saying, if you build it, they will come. That new arts facilities can be built in order to be an economic uh, transformer of cities, perhaps cities that had been lost in the post-industrial age. And so this spread across the globe. And so a lot of the traditional donor class made their biggest gift or perhaps their last gift to the capital construction project of these buildings. What we're seeing now with younger donors is that they're more process-driven than transaction-driven. So what does that mean? That means they care about how they give and not just what they give. And this is creating a growing tension between the generational funding perspectives and habits. So while rising generations are less interested about having their names on the wall of institutions or in gallery spaces and visual art museums. They're more interested in a transformational giving that's providing solutions to our most urgent global challenges. So they wanna see much more transparency about the impact and allocation of their gift. And they're also interested in new funding models such as impact investing or hybrid models. And the cultural sector in terms of fundraising, it's still pretty much the traditional Uh, write the check for the tax deduction to the institution. So given this perception by many next-gen donors that arts and culture organizations are disconnected from the social impact causes that those next-gen donors care about, Jamie, why do you personally believe that arts and culture organizations are important and worthy of your philanthropic investment? I believe that at the end of the day, change comes from the heart and change comes from the story. And that's what the arts do. That's the power that the arts have. The kind of old adage, the the beauty of art is showing humanity to itself. And that that mirror is the best way for us to really see and grapple with the moment that we might be living in. And the disconnect that Melissa mentioned several times between the the content, right? We all believe in changing hearts and minds, and we all believe in the power of uh, narrative change and what that can do. And we've all seen, you know, throughout history, culture change preceding policy change. But at the end of the day, the the money isn't following. And the disconnect has gotten so much greater because of our inability to go and experience the art in person outside of our homes. And when you're at home, it's easy to forget that these organizations are nonprofits and the nonprofits are typically not putting in the same type of work that they put in when you enter their doors to try and get you to understand the funding model. Uh, Go ahead. There's a little bit of irony there, right? So you talk about the power of the story, and yet what I'm hearing is that arts organizations aren't doing such a great job of, of telling their story about their connection to the social causes that, that next-gen philanthropists are concerned about. Exactly. That is the irony of the entire art sector, that the creativity of the arts world is what we are known for. It's what's on our letterhead. And yet when it comes to the infrastructure and the the way, just the way organizations are run and it trickles down, you know, from the top and is very evident 
evident in the development world and the fundraising piece, just the lack of creativity and the lack of the lack of connection between what's on the walls, what's on the stage, the the deep work that goes into the curatorial work and the way that organizations try and tackle their audiences, which, you know, turn into donors. And I believe that this moment in time has actually been a really great wake up call because it's forced organizations to not just do the same thing that they've been doing. I mean, forever organizations, every season, right? Like if we send out the annual appeal at the same time, then maybe those people will finally, finally like add a zero to their check or that foundation will finally, you know, allow us to get past the LOI stage or whatever it is, thinking that the people who aren't giving them money are the ones who are doing something wrong, right? As opposed to looking in the mirror and saying, wow, we do the same thing every single year and expect different results and maybe shame on us. Right. So, Melissa, turning to you now, what can you tell us about this wake-up call that Jamie's talking about? What does change really need to look like for arts organizations to bridge this gap with next generation donors? Cultural organizations have admittedly been behind in recognizing and adjusting and updating the work to attract next gen donors. And the events of the last year have have really only accelerated the need because they've accelerated the changes in the sector and I would say in society at large that the next generation wants to see. COVID, the economic stability, and a growing social justice movement have all made all of these issues much more relevant and urgent. So organizations know that unless they make pivots, they may not survive. And we have a very... um, unpredictable year coming up as we attempt to emerge from this public health crisis and an economic crisis, and also a crisis of work around social justice. So this work really cannot be performative, just as uh, work around DEI cannot be performative. It can't be performative of holding up a banner or creating a motto that will attract the next gen. It really has to be holistic. It has to be systemic. And that requires creating consensus and a new governing philosophy within institutions. So in order to do this work most effectively, organizations are starting to realize that a strategic planning process and a long range planning process are really essential as they look to this new era. It's become clear that the 21st century arts organization needs to be a place that is a town hall, that's a gathering place, where diverse communities can come together to examine and explore and debate our differences and also our commonalities. So in order to do that, it's going to require a systemic pivot. And those organizations that are engaging in that strategic planning work are going to be you know, ahead of the game in terms of setting their roadmap for future success, particularly among attracting this next generation of donors. This is Curtis from IPM Advancement jumping in for a moment. If you're a nonprofit professional who has questions about your program, or maybe you feel like you've taken your advocacy, fundraising, or membership effort as far as you can and you need some fresh ideas, we have a special offer for you today. NPFX podcast listeners can get a free 30-minute consultation with IPM, no strings attached, when you go to ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Just enter a few details and an IPM team member will contact you to follow up. It's that easy. That website again is ipmadvancement.com forward slash free. Thanks for listening and we hope to talk to you soon. Now let's return to the episode. You know, I, I got my start in nonprofit world building a performing arts center, the Walton Arts Center in Fayetteville, Arkansas. And, you know, it's made a huge impact over the last 30 some odd years in that community. And, you know, it taught me a lot. And one of the things that I've learned over the years is that the arts community typically tends to be on the forefront when it comes to social justice. It it embraces inclusivity. 
it goes out of its way to make its product available to the masses and, and, and even sort of integrating its product into the classroom so that the underprivileged can have access to it. The arts organizations embrace uh, people of different cultures and origins and orientations. And so it's, it's not that they're not embracing all those social causes, but we're not making a good case for it. So let's make a case for those, the, that small theater or that, that major museum. How can we help them? How can, what, what kind of advice can we give them to better display that, hey, we're actually doing these things? I think there's three things organizations can do immediately. One, they can start to formalize, create consensus around, and then articulate a new narrative that tells the story of how the organization is what I call a conduit to the cause. How are they addressing local and international challenges to their work? How are they creating social impact? And what, how are they helping make change in the world? And as you just mentioned, Rich, arts organizations at their core are about that, and they do that work. But somehow that story has been lost. And I hear from rising generation donors that it's been lost in the building of large new museums by world famous architects. The perception is that these organizations raise money for themselves and they don't do a lot of work outside of these beautiful buildings that we all want to see and, and, and walk into. So the perception that they don't need the money and the perception that they're focused on themselves and not the community. We need to break that down and tell a different story. As you mentioned, the work that organizations do, especially around education, is incredible. A lot of visual arts museums and performing arts education actually provide the arts education for the community, sometimes in place of a public school that has had cuts to their curriculum and therefore can't provide arts education. But that's not necessarily the first story we tell or the first thing that people see. So, you know, this issue, this this idea of, of supporting art for art's sake for those of us that are already super involved in this industry, in this sector, that resonates with us, but it's not the best tool anymore to draw in a generation that sees urgent challenges every day all around them from television to social media to what they see outside their door. So that shift in the narrative to describe how artists are bringing attention and awareness to these urgent issues, artists that are dedicated, their practices dedicated to social impact or to social justice that make people aware of these issues in a way that really nothing but art can. How arts funders can drive change in areas of our greatest need, that needs to be articulated. There are organizations which we can speak about that operate at the intersection of social impact and the arts. Funding those organizations can drive change. And also viewing artists as creative entrepreneurs who can contribute through business models or through practices, through products they develop to actually making that change in a significant way. So changing the narrative to show how the arts actually are addressing this urgency and this impact that we see very clearly in other sectors. We just sort of need to go the extra step and demystify that and tell the new story. The other huge opportunity is a better use of what's right in front of us and what is second nature, if not first nature, to rising generation donors, which is better utilizing digital opportunities. Rethinking social media strategy. How can you reach these donors? How can you create some peer-to-peer social media work so that gen- the rising generations are talking to each other on behalf of the institution. And also, how can you create stronger fundraising tools through digital media and digital platforms? There's tons of tools out there that can help in this way that can create a very, very simple way of giving. And you can link that to a social media campaign that potentially has peer-to-peer solicitations. And the other area is kind of related to the narratives, but how do we talk, speak differently about impact? Instead of just talking about the number of tickets sold to a performance, to an opera, to a ballet, talk about the themes in that ballet. How do they resonate? Interview your audience members. Talk about that impact. How has that created a changing of hearts and minds to people who are walking out of that performance or that exhibition? These are three things I think organizations can do in the near term to start to tell a different story that is going to resonate with rising generations. So, Jamie, how does all of that resonate with you? I mean, how can organizations demonstrate their value to philanthropists like yourself? 
I think before hitting on the the value piece, I would say the narrative part of what Melissa was just saying it really hit home for me just on what a terrible job the sector does on our own PR. We're excellent when it comes to PR for exhibits, when it comes to PR for shows, when it comes to PR for anything that we might be doing. But for ourselves, we pride ourselves on being the best kept secret. We pride ourselves on on people knowing us and knowing the work we do and knowing how deep our DEI work is and our social justice work is and how intrinsic that is to the arts and how we're not just checking a box. But we find ourselves too often in, in an echo chamber because we're assuming that since people see our pretty building, they pick all of that up. And we're not actually telling telling that story. And in t- so to the value proposition piece, we in the arts, this goes back to the, the funding model for the arts in this country and just how broken it is, but also how nobody really understands it. And nobody really understands where their dollars are going and why they are needed beyond the kind of obvious. During the pandemic, Melissa and I joked at one point, everyone was paying for yoga classes online to stream yoga classes. And everyone was paying to upgrade their Netflix subscription. So their mother and brother could also share it. You know, everyone was paying for all of these different types of 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 arts in in some form but when it came to theater companies streaming productions or museums doing kind of virtual galleries nobody was paying and it was kind of assumed that it was a public good which that could you know there could be an argument there <laughs> but that is not the way that the culture sector is currently set up and we historically have given things away for free in a way that undervalues our product. And then why would someone pay for it if we tell them they don't have to, right? And so this moment in time where people have started, the conversation that I'm referring to that Melissa and I had was fairly early on in the pandemic. And I think we've seen a huge uptick in organizations charging and and testing the waters, even Disney, testing the waters of how much will someone pay to get premium content, to get more content, to get it sooner, to get it faster. And a lot of theater productions have had some pricey tickets, you know, like $40 tickets, $60 tickets to watch something from your couch and have, you know, been met by lovers and critics on on all sides. Um, And how we keep that value, I think, is going to be really difficult because there's no clear path as things start to open up in person, how you keep the kind of monetized systems that people have put in place online with people valuing the experiences that they have received online, how that then translates to in-person. So I want to look at this focus from the younger philanthropists towards social impact and where that came from and, wh- and, and why that is. And, you know, putting that into context. So I look at the Giving USA report. And, you know, I look at the four sectors that saw the biggest increases, public society and benefit up by over 15 percent, individuals giving to individuals up by almost 13 percent, environment and animals up by over 11 percent and giving to human services up by almost 10 percent. Are we seeing a title shift in priorities in giving? I think the generationally there's a feeling that we can't ignore what's in front of us. We can't ignore that the world's on fire right now. We can't ignore that simultaneously the world's also sinking. And it often, for people who didn't grow up understanding the value of the arts, it can often feel like it's fluff, like it's not actually ingrained in our culture, our community, in our society in a value add way that is deeper than a fun night out. And again, it's the narrative piece, right? It's it's flipping that, it's shifting that because I think it's amazing that generationally we care so much. I think organizations in the arts have yet to figure out how to 
capitalize on that. We've always, in the arts, we've always been trapped in kind of the metric cycle of funders wanting us to have metrics that just don't make sense for the arts and us contorting in weird ways, trying to make the metrics applicable and explain ourselves until we're blue in the face. And it's not really serving anyone. It's just making boards feel better that they're doing their due diligence. So I, I think there is a new, there, there's a new way for us to measure the work that we're doing. I don't have that new way <laughs> in front of me right now. You know, and that's okay. We don't have to have all the answers yet. But what's great about the arts is that they're creative, right? And we do have some answers. So let's shift for a moment and talk about who is doing it right. Can you all give me some examples of organizations that are making the connection to social impact that are attracting and engaging next generation donors? Melissa? One organization that I'm incredibly fond of and is doing significant work and is actually the recipient of a recent round of funding from Mackenzie Scott Bezos is the Laundromat Project. And it's based in Brooklyn, New York. It's an arts organization that's dedicated to advancing artists and neighbors as change agents in their communities through art banking, through art celebration, and through the intersection of arts and social impact. So really looking at how the arts can strengthen creative communities and create community building in a local community. The organization started in a laundromat in Brooklyn, now is outside of a laundromat in a new building, but it's that community-based ethos that you don't have to be a small organization to have that ethos. You can be a very large organization. The Oakland Museum of Art in California underwent a social impact project a few years ago that really looked at the immediate community there in Oakland, how it was unique from the surrounding communities of San Francisco or Silicon Valley, and looking to really tailor their programming, their exhibition programming, public programming, educational programming to the local community. And they're a much, you know, their organization is, is much bigger than Laundromat. But you can see that across organizations of different sizes and budgets. Melissa, it's interesting that you brought up Oakland Museum because the first organization that came to mind for me was Brooklyn Museum. And I, find, I found myself feeling a little guilty that I picked such a large institution as the kind of the best example that was front of mind for me. But it is really amazing to see these large institutions, to watch them figure out how to be nimble, you know, to it's almost an art form itself to watch them pick up on their community and figure out what unique place they sit in and what power they have as a convening location and as that fourth space. Can you give I'm, I'm sorry, uh, Jamie, but can you give me some specifics about how the Brooklyn Museum was nimble? Of course, of course. Under Ann Pasternak's leadership, the Brooklyn Museum became a food bank during the pandemic to serve the community that the, the immediate community around the Brooklyn Museum, okay. which is a a very heavily underprivileged community that often historically has been left out of the museum's activities. And Anne has really taken it upon herself to figure out how she can best serve the neighborhood, you know, not just Brooklyn and not just the international audience because her programming is spectacular, but the people who are actually at your doorstep, instead of excluding them, right, and saying we're bigger than this, we're more important than this, how do you become a museum for a neighborhood museum, really? So just to, to follow that up, how, how does the museum then continue on and stay integrated and, and keep involving that community? So she has she's launched some really incredible education programs, working specifically with youth in that in that community who would not normally be um, be exposed to the arts or feel welcome necessarily within the museum's walls by providing services that are needed after school services, services that parents are really hungry for, for their children. You know, they happen to be in the arts, but it's not because they're in the arts. It's because they're basic needs that parents need for their kids. And the Brooklyn Museum has been able to really step up and take care of their community and put their community first. Is there a feeling that, that arts and culture organizations are sort of uniquely tuned into those community needs? Absolutely. Absolutely. I, 
the thing about the arts and what Melissa was saying earlier about arts workers being thought of as more than just artists, right? And being really thought of for their minds and their creative minds and how they work. I often think about artists as being experts of the human condition. And that's not something that you see often in a job description, but it's something that money can't buy that either you are or you aren't. And it's a way of, it's a way that arts people are wired. And it is a whole different way of looking at the world and understanding the interconnectivity of all of us. It, it, it's that emotion, it's the passion, it's the empathy. So much of art that is created is built on those things, emotion and passion and empathy. And don't we so, need that right now? I mean, if the arts show us our humanity and they mark our moment in history, I like to say the arts matter because we matter because the arts are us. And I think we can all agree we're at a critical moment in human history and we're at a critical moment in the United States of America where to see our own and see each other's humanity is crucial. And I think to add to what Jamie said about how artists look at the world and how cultural workers from executive directors of organizations to board members, to fundraisers, to programmers, to curators, uh, artistic directors are kind of, that's the service, right? The service is actually providing that product, which allows us to look at our own humanity and look at each other through, through very human eyes. And by being that 21st century arts organization, we can do that. And that's the service that the arts and culture industry offers and a huge argument for why it should be funded at the rates of every other sector, because it's actually aiding work and advocacy in every other sector. And I think there's a great opportunity there for organizations in the arts to work with counterparts in public health, in um, organizations that are dedicated to promoting democracy, to organizations uh, that perhaps work in the legal world or with incarceration, with poverty, with homelessness. There's great opportunity, and we've seen from research that funders, especially next-gen funders, really want to see that collaboration and that partnership. And their funding can have a much stronger impact when they fund at the intersection of these greatest global challenges. And the arts have a way of driving that point home to an audience that I don't think any other sector has. Let me ask one final question of each of you. If there was one insight that you want a listener to take away from the conversation today, or some key piece of advice that they could use to engage next-gen donors, what is it? What's that key takeaway? I think this moment in time is such an opportunity and so many people are looking at it as the, a crisis that's hopefully sooner rather than later coming to an end that has been dire and we're all going back to normal or some semblance of normal and being excited for that as opposed to really digging in deep to what we've learned and are continuing to learn about ourselves as donors for those of us in the donor camp and our institutions for those that are on the on the art side and how we can take those lessons and use them while we innovate moving forward and help be a part of creating the new whatever normal means, right? The new normal for the arts. Now that we have the spotlight on our sector, because the arts are what have gotten all, all of us through, right? When you point out to people like a puzzle is actually a piece of art that's broken up into a lot of little pieces, <laughs> books, right? Like everything that has gotten us through and helped us maintain some semblance of sanity in the past 18 months goes back to the arts. And I think picking up on Melissa's last point, this is way more than one takeaway, but that intersectionality piece, I think that really is the sweet spot for next gen donors. If you look at the way that different sectors are trying to understand implicit bias, and using artists, bringing in artists to work with doctors, bringing in artists to work with policemen to help them understand what it means when they say something or see something and how that comes off and the consequences of that. I think there's so much opportunity in terms of both funding and arts organizations digging in and thinking of themselves in 
in radically new ways to be more of service to this moment in time. Terrific. Thank you, Jamie. Melissa. Talk to next gen donors. Talk to next gen donors like Jamie. Jamie is at the helm of an incredibly impactful organization, the Nathan Cummings organization. Like Jamie, many next gen donors are stepping into their to philanthropic leadership roles with their family offices, with organizations, with foundations, making choices about the allocation of their gifts or their family gift. Those who work in the entrepreneurial space or tech space are setting up foundations now and determining where that money will go. And unless we're in conversation and listening, we're gonna have we're gonna have trouble keeping up with these other sectors we've talked about in the arts. Listen to these donors, involve them in your organization. Again, not in a performative way. Ask them how they want to be involved. Be willing to accept the fact that they want to roll up their sleeves and really be involved. This is not a generation that just wants to come to a board meeting four times a year and sit and listen and be reported out to. They have ideas. They want to create transformational giving with their philanthropy. They want to, I know it sounds corny, but change the world. And so how can an organization leverage that interest and passion and that capacity in order to move ahead into a successful future for the organization? And listen to these donors talk about how they want the arts to create change, work with them to do so. This has been a fascinating conversation. I want to, I want to wrap up. Uh, I don't want to wrap up, but I have to wrap up, and I apologize. But I also want to give each of you an opportunity to plug any uh, specific nonprofit organization that you would like to support. Where do we find out more about them? I'm a big fan of the Recess organization, uh, also in Brooklyn, New York. It was uh, founded in 2016, and it works with system-impacted young people to create inroads to art and connection. Um, with working artists and offers an alternative to incarceration for youth that are incarcerated through art making. It is recessart.org. And the specific program that works with incarcerated youth at the intersection of art and social impact is called Assembly. Awesome. Thank you, Melissa. Jamie? My, My one plug will be for an organization called Artists Striving to End Poverty. The website is astep.org, A-S-T-E-P dot org. And it is an organization that firmly believes that arts hold the potential to break the cycle of poverty. Super. Hey, Jamie Mayer, Melissa Kelly-Wolf, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That wraps up our discussion about next-gen donors in the arts. Thanks to our panel, Rich Frazier, Melissa Cowley-Wolf, and Jamie Mayer for sharing their insights and expertise. If you'd like to learn more about our panel members, we'll include that information in the show notes. We will also provide links to the nonprofit organizations referenced during the show. If you like this episode, please subscribe in Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, or your favorite podcast app, and leave us a review. Reviews are one of the best ways you can help us reach more nonprofit professionals like yourself. For back episodes and more resources like white papers, infographics, and blog articles, please visit the free IPM Advancement Nonprofit Resource Library at ipmadvancement.com forward slash resources. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time. (laughs) 